Hi everybody, welcome to day I think 18 of Carrie's Corner where we are going to do something historic today. We are going to finish The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham illustrated by Eric Kincaid. We have read this whole book together and this book totals 156 pages. That's a lot of reading what we've been doing. Because I think when you listen to someone reading aloud, in a way you're kind of reading too and that hopefully inspires you to read as well. So here we are, we're in the end of the chapter, The Return of the Hero. The badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank open face made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He left the room in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea had occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, and he would take care to mention the leading, weasel, the leading part he had taken in the fight and how he had laid the chief weasel flat, and he would hint at his adventures and what a career of triumph he had to tell about. And on the first page, he would give a sort of program of entertainment for the evening, something like this as he sketched it out in his head. Speech by Toad. There will be other speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad. Synopsis, our prison system, the waterways of old England, horse dealing and how to deal. Property, its rights and its duties, back to the land, a typical English squire. Song by Toad, composed by himself. Other compositions by Toad will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. There he is, working on his letter. Seems like it's an evening a lot about Toad. The idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon, at which hour it was reported to him that there was a small, rather bedraggled weasel at the door, asking timidly whether he could be of any service to the gentleman. Toad swaggered out and found it was one of the prisoners of the previous evening, very respectful and eager to please. He patted him on the head, shoved the bundle of invitations into his paw, and told him to go along quickly and deliver them as fast as he could, and if you like to, come back again in the evening. Perhaps there might be a shilling for him. Or again, perhaps there mightn't. And the poor weasel seemed really quite grateful and hurried off eagerly to do his mission. When the other animals came back to lunch after a morning on the river, the mole, feeling somewhat guilty, looking doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or depressed, instead he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged knowing glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, Well, look after yourself, you fellows. Ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after, and did his best to get away. But when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see the game was up. The two animals took him between them into a small smoking room, that opened out in the entrance hall, shut the door, and put him into a chair. Now look here, Toad, said the rat. It's about this banquet, and very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this, but we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp the fact that on this occasion we're not arguing with you, we're just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him. They saw through him. They had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Can't I sing just one little song? He pleaded. No, not one little song, replied the rat firmly, though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor toad. It's no good, toady. You know well that your songs are all conceited, boasting, and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise, and, and, well, and gross exaggeration, and, and, Goss, put in the badger in his common way. It's for your own good, Toad, he went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems a splendid time to begin, a sort of turning point in your career. Please, don't think that saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. Toad remained a long while plunged in thought. At last he raised his head, and the traces of strong emotion could be seen on his face. You have conquered, my friends, he said sadly. It was, to be sure, but a small thing that I asked, just to expand for yet one more evening, to let myself go and hear the deafening applause that always seems to me somehow to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know, and I am wrong. 
From now on, I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never know. She'll never have to blush for me again. But oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. And pressing his handkerchief to his face, he left the room with faltering footsteps. Badger, said the rat. I feel like a brute. I wonder what you feel like. Oh, I know, I know, said the badger gloomily. But the thing had to be done. This good fellow has got to live here and hold his own and be respected. Would you have him a common laughing stock, mocked and jeered at by stoats and weasels? Of course not, said the rat. And talking of weasels, it's lucky we came upon that little weasel just as he was setting out with Toad's invitations. I suspected something from what you told me and had a look at one or two. They were simply disgraceful. I did away with a lot, and the good mole is now sitting in the blue boudoir, filling up plain, simple invitation cards. There's Toad weeping. And then Badger and Rat having their chat. At last, the hour for the banquet began to draw near, and Toad, who, was on, who on leaving the others had retired to his bedroom, was still sitting there, sad and thoughtful. His brow resting on his paw, he pondered long and deeply. Gradually, he took to giggling in a shy, self-conscious manner. At last, he got up, locked the door, drew the curtains across the windows, collected all the chairs in the room, arranged them in a semicircle, and took up his position in front of them, swelling invisibly. Then he bowed, coughed twice, and letting himself go, with uplifted voice, he sang to the enraptured audience that his imagination so clearly saw. This is called Toad's Last Little Song. The toad came home. There was panic in the parlor and howling in the hall. There was crying in the cowshed and three shrieking in the stall. When the toad came home, when the toad came home, there was smashing in a window and crashing in a door. There were chivying of weasels that fainted on the floor. When the toad came home, bang go the drums. The trumpeters are tooting and the soldiers are saluting and the cannon they are shooting and the motor cars are hooting as the hero comes. Shout hooray and let each one of the crowd try and shout it very loud in honor of an animal of whom you're justly proud for its toes. Great day! He sang this very loudly with great energy and expression. And when he had done, he sang it all over again. Then he heaved a deep sigh, a long, long, long sigh. Then he dipped his hairbrush in the water jug, parted his hair in the middle, and plastered it down very straight and sleek on each side of his face. And unlocking the door, went quietly down the stairs to greet the guests who he knew must be assembling in the drawing room. All the animals cheered when he entered and crowded round to congratulate him and say nice things about his courage, his cleverness, and his fighting qualities. But Toad only smiled faintly and murmured, not at all, or sometimes for a change. On the contrary, Otter, who was standing on the hearth rug, describing to an admiring circle of friends exactly how he would have managed things had he been there, came forward with a shout, threw his arm round Toad's neck, and tried to take him round the room in triumphal progress. But Toad, in a mild way, was rather snubby to him, remarking gently as he disengaged himself, Badger was the mastermind, then the mole and the water rat bore the brunt of the fighting. I merely served in the ranks and did little or nothing. The animals were evidently puzzled and taken aback by this unexpected attitude of his, and Toad felt, as he moved from one guest to the other, making his modest responses, that he was an object of great interest to everyone. The badger had ordered everything of the best, and the banquet was a great success. There was much talking and laughter among the animals, but through it all, Toad, who of course was in the chair, looked down his nose and murmured pleasant nothings to the animals on either side of him. Now and then he stole a glance at the badger and the rat, and always when he looked, they were staring at each other with their mouths open, and this gave him the greatest satisfaction. Some of the younger and livelier animals, as the evening wore on, got whispering to each other that things were not so amusing as they used to be in the good old days, and there were some knockings on the table and cries of, Toad, speech, speech from Toad, song, Mr. Toad, song. But Toad only shook his head gently, raised one paw in mild protest, and managed to convey to them that this dinner was being run on strictly conventional lines. He was indeed an altered Toad. I don't know if I believe it. After this climax, the four animals continued to lead their lives, so rudely broken in upon by civil war, in great joy and contentment, 
undisturbed by further risings or invasions. Toad, after due consultation with his friends, selected a handsome gold chain and locket set with pearls, which he dispatched to the jailer's daughter with a letter that even the badger admitted to be modest, modest and grateful. The engine driver in his turn was properly thanked and rewarded for his pains and trouble. Under the strongest pressure from the badger, even the barge woman was, with some trouble, sought after, and the value of her, ho of her horse made good to her. Though Toad kicked terribly at this, holding himself to be an instrument of fate, sent to punish fat women with mottled arms who couldn't tell a real gentleman when they saw one. The amount involved, it was true, was not very great. Local traders agreed that the price the gypsy had paid was approximately correct. Sometimes, in the course of long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll together in the wild wood, now successfully tamed so far as they were concerned, and it was pleasing to see how respectfully they were greeted by the inhabitants and how the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the mouths of their holes and say, pointing, Look, baby, there goes the great Mr. Toad, and that's the gallant water rat, a terrible fighter walking along of him. And yonder comes the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you often heard your father tell. But when the infants were troublesome and quite beyond control, they would quiet them by telling how, if they didn't hush them and not fret them, the great terrible badger would up and get them. This was not true at all of Badger, who, though he cared little about society, was rather fond of children, but it never failed to have its full effect. That is the last word of our book, The Wind in the Willows. There's the very last page and the very last image. And stay tuned Monday, where I'm reading a book called The Pushcart War. And you'll have to go back to day 16 and 17 to hear the beginning. I'm going to start it because I already started it a few days ago. So you can hear the beginning that way and we will all read it together. So see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Hope you do something fun. Bye-bye.